Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the regular City Council meeting of the DeKalb City Council, August 26, 2019. Prior to our call to order tonight and our roll call, uh, I would like to uh, remind anyone in the audience tonight uh, who would like to speak to any item on our agenda, or for that matter, any item not on our agenda, to uh, simply fill out a speaker request form, get that to our city clerk, Lynn Fizikas. She will get it to me, and we will get you on in the order of the agenda thank you and uh, we will I'll try to do my best we have quite a few uh, who would like to speak tonight so uh, having said that uh, I would like to um, call this meeting to order officially and Lynn Fasikas if you would please call the roll Morris Fanukin. Here. Smith. Here. Fagan. Here. McAdams. Here. Verbick. Here. Favor. Here. Mayor Smith. Here. Seven present. Jeff, if you put the picture up on the screen, please, we would move forward with the national anthem. Uh, this young lady, uh, Grace Verbick, is the daughter of our sixth ward alderman, uh, Mike Verbick. And uh, she had a very, very special task, or an honor, if you will, about a month ago at a Chicago baseball game. And with her permission, we've asked her to allow us to play the video of that. Before we... Uh, do hear Grace's version of the National Anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't allow our sixth ward alderman, uh, Mike Verbick, to make a few introductory comments. It's pretty neat how life's connections can uh, come up with these special opportunities. And it was just a conversation at work uh, I was having with a colleague, and that colleague said, uh, it was very interested in uh, Grace's uh, major in, in voice and opera in college, and he also happens to work for the White Sox uh, part-time, and said, we're looking for those uh, to send, sing the Star Spangled Banner, banner and uh, all your daughter would have to do is submit a recording of uh, an audition of uh, the Star Spangled Banner. She did, and it w with, within a matter of days, uh, they contacted her and said, We'd like you to perform, and wow, she was just uh, blown away and very, very nervous uh, going into this opportunity, but uh, certainly once she got into it, uh, everything uh, went well. Uh, Chicago White Sox, uh, our top class organization, made her feel very comfortable. Staff were outstanding, and we had a great time. Thank you, Mike. And now if you join me, if you're able to stand and uh Celebrate with us as Grace Verbick, a DeKalb girl, sings the national anthem, and we'll follow that with the Pledge of Allegiance.
United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I'd like to uh, note, too, that for those of you who may have been at the Community Pride Benefit Concert last Wednesday at uh, Hopkins Park, I commend Mike Embry for uh, putting that together. Uh, it raised some money to benefit the fire victims uh, in DeKalb and in Sycamore. And Grace came out uh, from Chicago and, and sang that, and uh, it was just uh, very, very good. So, Mike, I know you're real proud of her. and. We, we thank Grace for allowing us to, uh, to play that tonight. Okay, our, if, you're, if you do have a copy of the agenda, we will follow this through as uh, closely as we can. Uh, we're now at the approval of the agenda. Are there any additions or deletions to tonight's agenda? I move Alderman to- Alderman Morris. Thank you. I move to adjust the agenda to um, consider item K, to be a first reading rather than a second reading. Okay, the move is that a number one? Ordinance number one? Correct. Okay. Ordinance second reading one. And you would like, your motion is to make that as a first reading? Correct. Okay. There's been a motion made? Second. And there is a second to that. Any discussion? Alderman Finucan. Just uh, if we could get some clarification from our city attorney if that is theoretically possible or not. Hello? Okay. Thank you, Alderman. It, it is on, the, on for a second reading. It did have a first reading. There are amendments to it, and that is not uh, unusual. The, uh, the purpose of a, a second reading really is twofold. It, it allows the board and the council to chew on this a bit and to see what, what changes, if any, they would like to make. And, and number two, uh, it does give people who may have been absent from the first reading the opportunity to have some public input into the ordinance. So it is, it is on second reading, and it's normally a matter of parliamentary procedure where you could do it, and it can, certainly can be amended on second reading and, and passed in its amended form. What's being asked here, uh, John, is that we would s basically start all over, right, with, with first reading. Is that something that at this point mm -hmm. that parliamentary procedure tells us what we could do? Well, yeah, no, normally it's, on, it's already had a first reading, so it, it's on second reading. I, I suppose I beg to differ that I don't believe this um, has had a first reading because it is substantially different from the item we considered when we considered it a first reading. The first time we read it, we were considering whether or not to change the clerk's position from an appointed to an elected position. This time, we are, we're no longer making that consideration, but we are now assessing what duties should comprise the role. And so I would um, suggest that this is no longer the same ordinance, no longer the same item anyway. It, it, it is fairly routine um, to have changes in a second reading. The Illinois State Legislature does a three reading process and it's not uncommon for them to start all over in the middle of the, of the whole process to gut everything to start fresh. So uh, the fact it's been changed really from a parliamentary procedure matter is is not really a, a concern as far as whether it should be considered first reading or second reading. So what Alderman Morris is seeking is absolutely within our legal boundaries to do tonight. 
Well, parliamentary, the, the proper procedure would be to leave it at, at a second reading. As a second reading. Would uh, that would that would that be okay, uh, Carolyn? We're going to talk about any changes or anything uh, in second reading. I, I just think I'm a little bit concerned because this is so substantially different, and um, I believe you know we first heard about this on Thursday, and so I think it would allow the community more time to assess their perspective on this, and allow the alderman more time. Oh, so what you're looking for is more time, f yeah, in this because unless we were to waive second reading uh, on that, we would we would start over, I guess. I, I think this just needs a thorough review, and I think there's potential that we could pass it as is today, and that's um, you know without having given it more than two business days. Oh, I see. Yeah, three business days assessment. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we uh, change Ordinance 2019-054, amending Chapter 3, City Administration, Section 3.14, City Clerk, from second reading to first reading. And it's been uh, seconded by Alderman McAdams. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Morris. Yes. Fanukin. Yes. Smith. No. Fagan. No. McAdams. Yes. Verbic. No. Favor. No. Three I. Four nay. So that motion is defeated to change the ordinance from second reading to first reading. i make the motion the agenda be approved as presented. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Fanukin, seconded by Alderman Fagan, that we approve the agenda as printed. Discussion. Roll call. Yes. Smith. Yes. Fagan. Yes. McAdams. Yes. Verbic. Yes. Favor. Yes. Morris. No. Smith. Yes. Seven I, one nay. Thank you. We now move along to public participation, and this is the opportunity for anyone who would like to speak to any item on the agenda or not in the agenda to uh, please come forward. Uh, we do have a very hefty uh, group of folks who would like to speak, so we would like you to try to keep your comments to uh, uh, three minutes or less. Also, I know we have some folks in the audience, including our esteemed former city clerk, uh, Peggy Hoyt, uh, who is uh, in a wheelchair and is not able to get to the podium, so I've asked uh, our assistant city manager, Ray Munch, when your name comes up, Ray will bring the uh, uh, wireless mic over and Peggy and any others who may be of in need of that special assistance will make sure we get a mic to you as opposed to you having to go over there, okay? Okay, our, let's move right along then to item E under presentations. Jerry, is nobody speaking at this time in public participation? Oh yes, I beg your pardon. Is there anyone at this point who would like to speak under public participation? Uh, you have the choice of speaking now or uh, speaking at the time when the ordinance or the item on the agenda uh, is, is uh, brought up. Anybody would like to speak now? Yes, sir. Um, and you, do, do I have your speaker request form? No, you do not. No. Okay. Do I need it for this? Please. Mm -hmm. A speaker request form? Yes. You Federal. can speak now or you can speak at any, at, at the time the... Uh, well, if I can speak now, I'd like to speak now. Okay. Sir, if you'd go to the podium, though, so that it can yeah. be recorded. Thank you. And, and, I, and I please give, we'll give us you your a, name, please. My name is George Christensen. Thank you. And uh, I would just like to speak on the topic of appointing the city clerk. I'm a little confused as to what 
appointing the city clerk brings to the citizens of DeKalb. I don't see any benefit to taking the right to electing a city clerk from our citizens. And as I understand it, this has been brought up several times and defeated several times. And I am really curious as to why we seem to think we have the time to waste on this again. That's all I have to say. Thank you. And I think that item will be brought up tonight also again. All righty. Uh, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Have you got a speaker request form? Good. If you would simply give that to me. If that's okay, Lynn. Okay. Michelle Foster. I would I also like to speak on the matter of the clerk. I feel that if the referendum has passed several times, that it should be an elected position. I don't understand why it's needed at this time. The clerk is a check and a balance, and there's no reason why if the citizens have said they want it to be elected, that it should be changed at this point in time. I live in Tracy Smith's ward, sir. As my representative, please listen to people. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, anyone else at this point? David, DK, and you do have, a, have you got a speaker request for him, Pair David? Okay, I'll find it. The mic is yours. Well, thank you. I didn't get you anything. <laughs> I'm just really concerned about well, Carolyn's amendment. I'm not sure how you can do a second reading on an entirely new document. It's so different. I mean, you passed the first reading for document A, and now you have document B, and you're going ahead as if it were still the same document. It's totally changed. I'm just really confused how that could be legal. Thank you. Thank you, David. Okay, anybody else at this time? Okay, well then let's move along. Again, those of you who have filled out a speaker request form, I'm going to assume now that you'd like to speak when we get to that item on the agenda. Okay, we're at presentations. Uh, proclamation, landlord, tenant, and property owners housing. I have a, a proclamation in front of me. I would like to read it in its entirety at the request of our Human Relations Commission. For the benefit of uh, those of you who uh, have been following city government, you know that we have 14 boards and commissions, many commissions like the Human Relations Commission, make recommendations to council and uh, uh, we will uh, move forward and with their suggestions and take those suggestions seriously. So this uh, landlord, tenant, and property owner's housing proclamation uh, was passed by the Human Relations Commission and, uh, has been and I've been asked to read that. Uh, so if you would please allow me just a couple of minutes. Whereas the city of DeKalb and Northern Illinois University have a long history of cooperation, and whereas the city and NIU have joint responsibility for the safety and well-being of its student residents, and whereas the on-campus residential safety and living conditions of its students has been closely monitored by the university, and whereas the safety and living conditions for students and residents who live in off-campus housing continue to be a concern for the city and NIU, and whereas most landlords and property owners of off-campus housing who call DeKalb County home maintain safe and in clean environments, and whereas a few landlords and absentee property owners have not maintained safe and clean residential properties, and whereas the city inspections have identified code violations and assessed fines after countless contacts to landlords and property owners, and whereas some landlords and property owners have resisted maintaining their properties even after these reminders of violations, including trash in the hallways and outside of the buildings, emergency cameras broken, outside doors broken and not secure, mold in apartments, carpets not cleaned, nor walls painted before new tenant occupancy, and various plumbing and electrical problems not fixed, 
and whereas in some properties, tenants are engaging in vandalism and contributing to the building trash, and whereas some property tenants have begun to form tenants associations like the DeKalb Tenants Association to help improve the living conditions of tenants, then it be proclaimed that the city of DeKalb will continue to provide law enforcement and legal actions if necessary to ensure safe and habitable housing and calls on landlords and property owners to renew their efforts this summer to bring their properties up to code for safety and cleanliness standards and that residents of these properties assist in maintaining their residences for the benefits of all tenants be it as individuals and or as part of a tenants association in witness thereof, I have set my hand and caused the seal of the city of DeKalb to be affixed this 26th day of August, 2019, signed Jerry Smith, Mayor. I'd like to present this proclamation to our Human Relations uh, Commission uh, Chair, Larry Apperson, who would then like to make some comments. Larry? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the Human Relations Commission is appreciative of uh, your reading of this proclamation. The uh, Human Relations Commission has become aware, as many of you have, through the media or through comments you've heard uh, in public, uh, that um, some of our rental properties uh, have not been maintaining the health or safety standards that are really necessary and I think uh, reflect what we are all about here in the city of DeKalb, which is to provide safety and well-being for all residents, even those that rent. Um, the HRC has been working to learn more. Um, we became aware that obviously we've got uh, landlords and property owners that are doing a great job. Uh, unfortunately, we discovered we have a few uh, that are not doing such a great job. Uh, we also discovered in our, in our listening to people that some of our property owners legitimately have problems with their tenants who are not helping with cleanliness nor uh, keeping up their own apartment, let alone the building. Uh, so we concluded, and, and the reason with the proclamation calling for a joint effort is I think it's about time that all those major players take a step up and start getting the complexes that are not up to standards into a livable condition that is safe and sanitary. The fact that we have documentation on mold in our, in our apartments, black mold, that doesn't get attended to. We have door and security systems that get broken and not fixed. We have trash in hallways. We have it around the building. Um, is in this day and age, and with a university community, and now I'm speaking just of student tenants, when you have a university like many of our public state universities struggling for to maintain enrollments, partly because that age group is declined in the, in the demographics, we can't afford to have substandard housing for the rental community. We all have to do what we can to bring up the standards and make sure the word of mouth, in this case of student tenants, to their friends back home will say something to the effect, yeah, I've had a pretty good experience. In fact, you know, I'm going to be graduating. You might want to see if you can rent my apartment. I don't think we're getting that word of mouth currently for several of our complexes. In fact, if you go out on social media, you will see that it's quite the contrary. So I just want to reflect again that I think this is doable. I, I, I don't understand why 
a community as ours that has young individuals that are going to be getting apartments, knows of families that are also renting, and has children that are in some pretty poor sanitary conditions in their apartments. I don't understand why that goes on. I really don't. Uh, I think everyone, council, the Human Relations Commission, people in this audience, people who are residents in our community, I don't think we should take that any longer. I think we have a moral duty to get anyone you know that is associated with any property that is treating rental individuals the way you're going to hear some of them have been treated absolutely unacceptable leave this community then if you cannot maintain a proper facility and with that in mind I'd like to introduce the uh, one of the chief organizers of the DeKalb Tenant Association uh, Jacob Moss uh, Jacob has been working very hard in, if you, any of you have ever done community organization work, you know what this is like, uh, to try to be a positive part of this solution. Jacob, if you would, please come and tell us a little bit about the association and what your goals are. And Jacob, before you start, uh, try to keep it to three minutes because I know you have a, full, a number of your associates who would like to speak. And again, just a reminder, we have a lot of folks to speak on items tonight, mm -hmm. so try to keep it to three. Thank you. I'll keep it quick. I just want to thank Larry for his words uh, and for his support in helping to voice tenant needs in this community. Uh, it is important to talk about the cleanliness, the black mold that is pervasive, the maintenance requests that go unfulfilled. Uh, but it's not just that. The reason why we have this problem is because tenants in this community they don't know their rights and they don't have effective enforcement mechanisms to hold landlords abuse accountable tenants often don't receive the receipt that is required by law for them to get their security deposit back tenants in this town are subject to evictions that are legal above the needs of cleanliness and habitability of these places uh, people are being predated upon and they're being charged things that uh, they don't really have any way to uh, I mean people can go to small claims court but most people in, uh, aren't trained on like how to do that so we need better tenant education in this community we need better enforcement mechanisms that tenants who are facing abuse can use to uh, try to hold those people that are inflicting uh, that upon them uh, accountable so tonight we're going to hear from some people in this community who have been victims of fires uh, people who don't have their maintenance requests met uh, and all sorts of stuff that people need to understand is happening in this community it affects students who go to school it affects families who work here and our community should not tolerate this thank you Jacob and thanks for your leadership I do have a number of those speaker request forms. These were given to Lynn Fazekas in this order, so I'd like to call these folks up. John Higgins. I'm going to be polite. I'm not going to be able to. Okay. Uh, Ray, this gentleman, Mr. Higgins, is going to want, need a wireless mic. Please. Thank you, Mayor. Mm. Um, I am a victim with Hunter DeKalb Properties. Um, I have legitimately dealt with housing. Housing has taken them off of Section 8 housing altogether because of what they've done to me. Uh, but now they're changing their names to Hunter Star and it's basically the same people. Now, I was a victim of paint, not painted walls. Uh, I didn't have heat. I didn't have uh, any proper maintenance done to my apartment. And it got so bad that when they did, um, they wanted me to sign a lease two months early, which I did, but then it failed six inspections. Three state inspections, three uh, city inspections. Uh, at which time uh, I invoked my right of my lease of Article 15 and I moved out. Um, I am in the middle of a small claims court uh, case uh, that hopefully it will end on Wednesday but anybody that wants to know how to get through their loopholes I will be more than happy to tell you because I have done it and 
this needs to stop. I mean, I lost everything I owned. And I'm talking about stuff that cannot be replaced. And I'm sorry I'm taking over three minutes, but I had a 30-year collection of pewter wizards that my mom gave me that they stole. And along everything else. I, 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 I'm done because I just want everybody to know that I appreciate you guys calling this meeting because it really needs to be addressed. Uh, it's not being addressed. I mean, six inspections failed and they still wouldn't fix nothing. I, I don't know, I don't understand it. And what made it worse was my rent was paid up until April 1st. I went to get the rest of my stuff and it was gone and everything was strewn all over the place and it was not called for. It, it, it really has put a stress on my life. And me going to court for eight months, I have lost over 50 pounds because of the stress and I'm afraid that I'm at a health risk. But thank you. Thank you, John. Our next individual is Roxanne Jenkins. Thank you. Hey, everybody. If this is the worst thing I can do is possibly stand here and talk in front of everybody. I absolutely, huh? Oh, I absolutely hate this. I do not like talking, but I just want to say that I lived there for three years, and the three years that I've lived there, it was absolutely a nightmare. Um, I lived on 902 Ridge, so I wasn't affected by the fires, but I was affected by mold. I was affected by um, things not getting fixed as needed, and um, we had supposed to ha we had a fob for the door to get in but they broke the door and they broke the lock. So um, once that happened, it was never replaced. So then we would have homeless people come in and they would be upstairs sleeping and then um, hanging out, drinking, and um, using the bathroom on the floor. And when, you t when we told the um, office about it they were just like um well i mean there's nothing we can do because we can't keep the people out well that's funny because i moved to sycamore i finally got out of the hell hole and went to a different place and we don't have locks on the outside locks but we we don't have people in the hallway not to mention the fact did they always say they were smoking weed in the building too yeah so we would walk through and there'd be like people just hanging out where are these people come these thugs i don't even know if they live around there but yeah, it was just a nightmare. And then in the winter time, we have to pay forty dollars at the time to get our um, for our um, parking pass. And then they never even took care of the parking. Um, I fell down several times because they just wouldn't do what we're entitled to. What is so complicated about having a nice environment with the basic things that we need? It's supposed to be land of the free, and we're. Where is that? It's certainly not with anything to do with Hunter, but thank you guys for listening, because now I feel like I have support behind me. Thank you so much. You've done a nice job. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Capricia Williams. And we're gonna need a mic there for Capricia. Hi, um, my name is Capricia Williams. Um, some of you may have read that article, but all of it's true. Hunting properties is terrible. And I've been there probably four years now, and I have failed every inspection. And it's to the point to where now they don't even lease with them. Um, I'm currently in the middle of uh, just basically working with family members and trying to find another place to be because I don't need to be in a situation where I'm dealing with mold. I have a condition, a chronic condition that like once you're sick, other things other things happen. You know, and it's like when you're paying for something, you expect better conditions and honestly there is I can remember there there was some sometimes where I had better conditions in the city 
big than where I, where I live now. And I'm like, if, if I wanted this, then I, you know, that's where I'd still be. I'm here, I'm a college student, a broke college student at that, so <laughs> this is like the last thing I need. And everybody knows that I'm pretty much an advocate for any kind of injustice, and I should be able to, you know, inhabit, you know, a space where I can be comfortable and not be sick. Because, you know, for me, it's chronic and it's all the time, so I mean, I'm doing what I can to maintain it, but, you know, having molds and having, you know, things not painted and constant flooding, that's, that's not, you know, um, inhabitable. But thank you guys for listening. Thank you. Appreciate, I appreciate it. Okay, our next speaker is Ryan Ziegelbauer. I hope I pronounced that correctly. You did. Good. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Uh, so I have been living in DeKalb for several years now, most recently at 305 North 1st Street, just across the way. Uh, and back in January of 2018, we had noticed that black mold had been creeping up. They had painted over it when we moved in. And the windows were very, very drafty. They were constantly covered in condensation, regardless of the heating, because they were so thin. And all of that condensation would pull around the windowsill, leading to, of course, black mold. Reported in January of 2018, and for a year and a half, we endured this constantly contacting our landlords to get anything done, and they would simply ignore us, giving us platitudes or, I'm sorry, we'll get around to it, but nothing would ever happen. Eventually, we follow the market, we move out of that apartment. The new apartment I've moved into had immediate issues with roof flooding, and just this morning I was woken up by a deluge coming down from my ceiling as the pipes had given way. Uh, my mattress has been soaked through, the mattress protector, the blankets, the pillows, the box spring itself, all soaked through and I had to replace it of my own money. Tenants in this town need some easy recourse for these injustices, as they are rightly called. And as a municipal body, you are perfectly situated to do that. The Better Business Bureau, going to small claims court, all of these are huge hassles that are very difficult for tenants, especially students, to deal with. And it's very important that you help these residents and these students to deal with these problems. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker is, and I think I've got this correctly, is it Debbie Bogaki? Debbie? Hi, my name Hi. is Dave Bogacki. I used to live at 808 Ridge. I was there for five years. I was there and rented from Princely when they first ran it. They were amazing, they were awesome. The cameras worked, the doors were locked. Appropriate people rented the apartment. And then once Hunter took over, their office was there for maybe about two, three months. They moved their apartment to Lincoln Towers. That's when everything went to shit cameras didn't work, doors didn't lock, people getting high in the hallways, the stairwells, nobody respected anybody. Well, since the fire, they condemned my building. It took me a month to get my stuff out of the condemned building because they would not let me know the times and days to go in and get my stuff. Well, they put me on Russell Road. Granted, the apartment's okay. I was there a couple weeks. Well, they told me they, could, they weren't specific on the door number that I was gonna move into on Russell, 830 Russell. She said, look for the door that looks like it's been kicked in. That's your new apartment. Oh, okay. So I go on there, there's still garbage in the apartment, everywhere. They told me it was garbage. A couple days later, the college student came back to get his stuff. That was his stuff, but I was told it was garbage. <coughs> his name was still on the lease. <coughs> he was still leasing that apartment when they put me in that apartment. What can I say? The water heater exploded, hot water everywhere. 
I had to call the fire department because I didn't know who else to call to. I couldn't call Hunter because they would show up seven days later to fix the problem. So I called the fire department. Thank God they were there within an hour to fix the problem. What can you do? I'm still leasing from Hunter because where can I go? I tried. I don't have money to pay for um, an what, what do you call those? No. Um, you know, you fill out the paperwork. Oh, application. Application. I don't have money for an application. I went to the cheapest place. They want $100 for me and my husband to fill out an application. Who has that? I don't even have 40 I have money to move, but where am I going to go? So, therefore, I'm stuck with Hunter for another year. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Tamara Person Hescott. Thank you. Short me here. Good evening. Good evening. I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to bring to you the face of homelessness, and I'm willing to admit that I know there's a lot of people in the community who go, oh, but you know what? This is the face of homelessness right now. And why? Because I have Section 8 housing, no more. I lived in 959 Fortis Drive, who's gone through three different um, management companies. Townsend, I'm sorry, but they were the worst. A lot of things were never fixed. When I moved into that place, I had, pre I had been at Hope Haven. I asked them if they would please fix these specific things like carpeting with holes in it. You could smell cat urine. The microwave in the, in the kitchen had half mass with the glass and they taped it and they glued it. That was their, their solution. Um, there were holes in the ceilings. There were silverfish. There were the doorbells didn't work, and there was just different things. And now I have children with autism and bipolar disorder, and I have a grandson now like that. They aren't with me, so housing asked me to move out of this three-bedroom apartment that I had maintained for five years. I was raised that you give something back better than what you received it in. I tried my best. I scrubbed. I scoured. I even had a friend who gave up of his time to help me get this done and gave me a place to live. Um, there were things like cockroaches. Suddenly, a year ago, I, w I had to go into some major surgery. And the night of my birthday, I saw a cockroach, and I just totally lost it. I was up the entire night. I actually went to my surgery the next day not sleeping, and partly because I was panicking and freaking out looking for cockroaches in the entire area of my apartment. And I had just gotten done cleaning and getting it ready for after surgery. Um, this went on for almost a year, and then I had, at that time, then Amber taken over. I have picked up garbage in these properties uh, with my children. I also, this past, exactly one year ago, we were cutting all the bushes and the shrubs because it looked so bad. Amber had asked me, or the maintenance person had asked me if I would do that, or at least my son, and I tried to help with that. So I would sit on a bench and I would cut and do what I could. Uh, I wasn't paid for it, wasn't nothing. Um, I have verification, people can prove that I did do that work. Um, what happened after that was then uh, Pitsley took over. <laughs> and um, by that time, he even, Mike had said I could stay. The problem was I had moved because of my housing and the amount of my voucher. All of my kids had moved out. Tamara, you're right at three minutes. Okay. Would you try to wrap it up? Yeah, I sure will. So um, there was more, there were several things that happened. And I was, they kept my $950 security deposit and they charged me $985 for things that were in immaculate condition considering some of the vandalism and we've had police in that neighborhood and I know several of the officers here know what I'm talking about because it's been pretty bad. So if we can get the community pulled together and yes some tenants are terrible. 
I've seen some of the conditions and it's embarrassing. But, you know, I'm not one of those tenants that vandalizes and wrecks things. I want a home. If you wouldn't live in that place, why would you expect me to live there? Thank and you. That's really what it is. Yep. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Appreciate it. Uh, James Mason. Wow. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? There's 10, 20, 30 reasons for what's happening here tonight. It's 30 years of mismanagement from one end to the other. The university cuts its enrollment and staff by 50, 60 percent. You have a vacuum in the uh, units and there's the real estate taxes almost double. So the reason that a lot of the maintenance is not being taken care of is the landlords don't have the money to fix the roof. This is a big deal. I've said to the, I've said to the uh, city manager and the mayor and other people, this is a health and safety issue. And the only way you're gonna be able to get out of this is through the courts. And the poor people in this room can't afford a lawyer so they're stepped on one way or the other. Now, as I was sitting there thinking about this, I helped with uh, Bessie Kanopoulos and I and a few other people. We put together the landlord-tenant law that is 90% today. Don Henderson was the first ombudsman, and he got sick of it, and they handed it off to me for a year. I took questions from landlords and tenants and told them where to go, what to do, and I'm saying right now to any tenants out there or landlords that don't know what to do, 815-901-4309. Wow. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Jim. I believe I have my paperwork straight, and only one other person wants to speak to this item, and that is Dave Rethke. So, um, I'm a landlord. I own one unit, and I pay my $50 a year to the city for enforcement. I had to go to the class, and I met a lot of the other small landlords in town. Uh, and the way it works is the city calls me up and says, hey, some kid wannabe just tagged your garage at your rental property. You need to get over and paint that. So the next day, I go over with a bucket of white paint, and I repaint the garage uh, to cover that up. And then they call me and they say, you got weeds growing in the alley. And I go over and I check and I call the city and I say, well, actually the tenant, the wildflowers that she put in there, I'd rather not tear them out. And they say, okay, no problem. But I have to follow the law as a landlord in this town. The largest, to give you a perspective here, the largest single rental owner in the country today is Blackstone, the equity group. You know, they weren't into real estate until the 2008 recession and they swept in and grabbed all kinds of foreclosed properties and turned around and became the big renter. We're kind of seeing that on a smaller scale here in town. Uh, we get groups like Hunter, which is a huge corporation, nursing homes, uh, they operate several states. Uh, they're the, if you're looking for gentrifying properties in Chicago, that's where you go, right? And what Hunter has done here in our town is they've come here and they've said to us, we are above the law. We have more resources than you have. We have more money than you have. So they basically incur fines, pay legal fees, and it's just part of doing business because it's cheaper than fixing the properties. And they've come to us in our town and they've said to us, they've laid down the marker that you can't touch us. You don't believe it, check out the newspaper article. Uh, recently, they're suing the city. They got hundreds of housing violations and they're coming back and saying, defamation of character, it's a slap suit, right? Because they're thinking at this point, we don't have the resolve as a city to take them on. That the city of DeKalb will say, we don't have the 
money to pay for additional legal resources to enforce our own laws. That the tenants won't get organized and say, we're not going to pay the rent and build political power. The Tenants Association, by the way, is the most positive thing happening here. Because when it comes time, at some point, I'm hoping the tenants don't pay their rent and that our sheriff sees the political power of organized people and says, I'm not doing evictions. But it's going to take some time and we've got to all come together on this thing. No one group, the city council, the tenant association, the landlords, none of us can do it alone. We have to be together on this thing and taking on 100 properties. Because they've laid down the market and we've got to respond, not in our community. And just one editorial comment, Mr. Rathkin. I think tonight's meeting shows that progress that you asked for. You know, uh, the, the proclamation, the HRC getting together, the tenants being here tonight. And believe me, we as a city council and we as a city administration fully realize that it, we have a couple of bad apples, perhaps. One has been outlined pretty specifically tonight but we have a wealth of good landlords who keep their properties clean who address the uh, com concerns of their tenants and so no one let me repeat no one should get the idea that this city council or this human relations commission is indicting our group of area rental agents, Dara and others. So Larry, I appreciate that. Jacob, I appreciate your time tonight. And uh, we'll move on to one more presentation, if we may. And that is Proudly DeKalb, introducing Judy Schneider, a DeKalb treasury. A DeKalb treasury. <laughs> Are you a DeKalb treasury, Judy? A DeKalb treasury. I'd like to have Bill Nicholas say a few words, and then I understand well, you have yeah, a presentation. I'll just introduce Judy. <laughs> Is this on? Yeah. Um, so Judy's been very quietly uh, working with our city departments for a lot of years. Uh, That's what makes me the treasure, the lot of years. Yeah, <laughs> working with a lot of local agencies. And uh, her passion is brightening the streetscapes around our community. She's, uh, thanks in large part to her initiative, she's enlisted to help many partners, master gardeners of the U of I, Cooperative Extension Service, the DeKalb High School FFA, Kishwaukee College Horticulture Students, Jaeger's Farm, DeKalb Community Gardens, and others. And for more than a dozen years, that involvement and with those agencies has uh, um, led to a lot of scenes that people enjoy without really knowing the the origin of them. Well, thank you. Here's a big part of that origin. I'm going to yield well, to thank Judy. thank you very much, Bill. She's got a video for us tonight. Yeah, okay. yeah good, good. And yeah. believe me, we notice. We notice when we drive around this community, especially Lincoln Highway, seeing the flowers and seeing the plants. Judy, we appreciate your work, and I'm going to turn it over to you now. Well, thank, thank you very give much. Give us a little presentation of what you've done in 2019. Thank you very much. I know you have some tough topics, so I'll try to keep this short. But um, I, I want to thank you for allowing me to celebrate a lot of our volunteers who, who do help with this program, and Bill mentioned a few of them. So the Master Gardeners have been helping for at least 20 years, and they come down in the spring. Uh, they help uh, plant all of the flower pots. Uh, they've been just really beneficial. NIU Cares Day students and staff as well, and the DeKalb High School Horticulture and FFA students, and you're going to see some glimpses of them as we go on. On the left there is some of the high school kids. They come down, and I've kind of given them Van Beer Plaza, and they've liked that they can take ownership of that. They come down on a very cold day in April. This day, actually, it, uh, they, they weren't able to stay because of the rain. But for a couple of hours, they were able to go in there and clean out all last year's growth. They come back a month later with plants that they have grown in their greenhouse. They donate them to the city, and they plant about a half dozen of the big plantation planters, as well as some different areas around Van Buren Plaza. I think that gives them pride, too, when they come through town to see that they've done that work. Here is some NIU CARES Day students. Uh, NIU has been doing this for many years. We t have teamed them up with our master gardeners, which is pretty neat. For the students, it might be the first time that they've ever done this kind of work. For the master gardeners, it's an opportunity for them to connect with 20-somethings 
and it's really a fun day. Over a three-hour day, they clean up all of the flower beds in downtown DeKalb with the help of some city staff as well. And uh, it, it's really helpful. This was our group this year. We had 40 students from all walks of life. And if you look closely, I can't point it out, but President Freeman, this is her second year helping our group downtown with the cleanup and our street superintendents, Andy Rye there in the background. But really just a lot of fun and many hands make light work. This would take us a lot of time to do this. And so we really appreciate that. And we have some vendor partners um, and you know, we pay them for their work, but they give us discounted rates. On the right are some of the students um, from the Walnut Grove Vocational Farm. They're students with disabilities who plant so many of the plants that we plant later in the planters. Kishwaukee Community College students as well uh, plant our big, large plantation planters. Uh, we take them there in the fall. They bring them back in the spring and keep them growing until we can put them on the streets in May. And then Derby Line Greenhouse and Jaeger Farm Markets uh, do our hanging baskets and keep them in our greenhouses for a lot longer than they want to until we can get them out on the street. But we appreciate that. So this was plant day this year. We had probably twice that many show up and uh, plant all of the different planters in, in downtown DeKalb. So beforehand, we kind of know what's going in the pots. And they go out with their little spreadsheets that I've put together. And they're often not planted the way I have set them out to plant, but they are every bit as beautiful when they get finished with them. And one of the neat things that I wanted to share too is these are people from all walks of life. On the right is a former school superintendent. In the middle, the former executive director of the DeKalb County Nursing Home, 3M executives, faculty from NIU and other places, just people from all around that come back and invest this time in our downtown. So it's, it's very much appreciated and here at the, the police department I thought I'd let you look at a few of the planters in case you haven't had a chance to go downtown it'll go pretty quick and then hear from a few people I did a little mini man on the street while I was down there in my father's <laughs> footsteps so we'll get to hear from them too I got this feeling inside my bones it goes electric wavy when I turn it on all from my city, all from my home We're flying up, no ceiling when we in our zone I got that sunshine in my pocket Got that good soul in my feet I feel that hot blood in my body When it drops, ooh I can't take my eyes off of it Moving so phenomenally Come on, like the way we rock it So don't stop it I didn't mention Lowe's and Walmart also donate things to us during the year. I wanted to make sure I got that in there. as well as our students. Our students are able to grow the plant material and then some of them get the opportunity to plant. You see the life cycle and it really is one of the best collaborations because when you go out and you're driving through DeKalb, you see these planters and you're just in amazement. I think your flowers are beautiful. I live in Mendota and they don't take care of them. I see the ladies and the guys come by and water them and they're beautiful outside. People comment about them. But that's one of those things that people, people don't notice until they're gone, I think. And um, I think they really make a beautiful downtown. Um, they're well cared for. People who do take care of them, uh, we appreciate their time. That was it. Thank you very much. Well, we're mad with joy, let me okay. tell you. <laughs> Thank you. You know, if there's any other community out there in Illinois or the environs who are looking at what flowers can do to a community, they ought to come to DeKalb, they ought to walk around, they ought to talk to Judy Schneider. Thank you so much. You are a community treasure. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, now we move to item G, consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda are enacted by one motion, uh, unless a council member would like one removed from the consent agenda. Does any council member have a desire to do that? Uh, okay, I'm going to read the consent agenda in its entirety. Number one, accounts payable and payroll through August 26, 2019 in the amount of $2,909,232.38. Number two, investment and bank balance summary through June 2019. Number three, year-to-date revenues and expenditures through June 2019. Number four, Freedom of Information Act, FOIA report, July 2019. And number five, Resolution 2019-123, approving the award of a bid to Bourne Transit Consulting, LLC, for on-call transit consultant services. I'd entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as printed. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Finucan, seconded by Alderman Favor. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Smith. Yes. Fagan. Yes. McAdams. Yes. Verbeck. Yes. Favor. Yes. Morris. Yes. Finucan. Yes. Mayor Smith. Yes. Eight aye. Thank you. The consent agenda is approved as printed. We have no public hearings tonight, item H, so we'll go to number I, considerations. Consideration of funding for the June 22, 2019 Balloons, Brews, and Blues event in the amount of $2,692. Uh, and I'd like to call on our city manager, Bill Nicholas, to speak to this item, please. Thank you, Mayor. As I stated in the background, back in uh, late January, the council uh, recommended uh, a, actually approved a, a budget reduction in uh, the area of, of community marketing and promotions. A total of $30,000 was uh, reassigned to uh, the reserve in effect, but uh, there was a suggestion as a follow-on that perhaps uh, up to $10,000 might be set aside for some purpose as yet unknown that the council would uh, be involved in the vetting of and uh, we have not had a, a uh, application until now and it comes to us from Mike Embry of the fund companies as you know uh, he was involved in uh, organizing and producing the the first balloons brews and blues event that the DeKalb Airport on June 22nd that uh, event uh, attracted about 1500 visitors it was held on runway 927 which is our north or our east-west runway and it's connecting taxiways uh, high winds that day uh, prevented the launch of the balloons although the balloon uh, uh, owners were there uh, but the event nevertheless featured a number of bands it was very well received uh, mr. Embry has asked for some help to to cover the cost of the expense of this particular promotion uh, the details are in your background uh, we recommend your approval of a grant of two thousand six hundred ninety two dollars since we approved the ten thousand dollars initially do you simply need consensus or would you like a motion to approve this I think a motion okay I'd entertain a motion to approve this request of twenty six hundred and ninety two dollars so moved second it's been moved by Alderman Verbeek, seconded by Alderman Smith. <coughs> Any discussion? Roll call, please. Fagan. Yes. McAdams. Yes. Verbeek. Yes. Favor. Yes. Morris. Yes. Fanuke. Yes. Smith. Yes. Mayor Smith. Yes. Eight I. Thank you. And Mike Embry, I see you're in the back there in the red. I, did you stand up purposefully so we could see you back there or not? <laughs> thank, thank, thank you very much for what you continue to do in terms of entertainment, etc. cetera. Uh, balloons, brews, and blues were only one of those uh, components. So thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, we move along to item J, resolutions. The following resolutions can be passed via omnibus vote if the council members agree to it. 
You've had a chance to take a look at these. Is there agreement that we can take these in omnibus form? Okay, let me read those. And then we'll have a motion. Number one, resolution 2019-124, authorizing a 2000, excuse me, 2019 sub-recipient agreement with the Children's Learning Center for the Community Development Block Grant funds in the amount of $12,000 for funding the transportation program. Number two, resolution 2019-125, authorizing a 2019 sub-recipient agreement with Elder Care Services for Community Development Block Grant funds in the amount of $8,000 for funding the Choices for Care program. Number three, resolution 2019-126, authorizing a 2019 sub-recipient agreement with Hope Haven for Community Development Block Grant funds in the amount of $17,000 for funding the Emergency Shelter Program. Number four, Resolution 2019-127, authorizing a 2019 subrecipient agreement with Safe Passage for Community Development Block Grant funds in the amount of $15,000 for funding for emergency shelter and services programs. And number five, Resolution 2019-128, authorizing a 2019 subrecipient agreement with the Voluntary Action Center for Community Development Block Grant funds in the amount of $13,860 for funding for the Summer Meals Program at University Village. I'd entertain a motion to approve these resolutions uh, as they were read in omnibus form. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Morris, seconded by Alderman favor uh, before we ask city manager Nicholas to speak to this item I'd like to indicate that both uh, Alderman Smith and Alderman uh, Fagan have recused themselves because they have an interest uh, in representing uh, one or more of the agencies that were represented city manager Nicholas I just want to add mayor that uh, Joanne Rouse uh, is our point of contact with these agencies uh, as she has been for a number of years. She is a coordinator of our CDBG program and I'm grateful to her for the careful vetting that she's done in the preparation of these documents for you tonight. Thank you. Any further discussion? Roll call please. McAdams. Yes. Verbic. Yes. Favor. Yes. Morris. Yes. Finucan. Yes. Smith. Fagan. Mayor Smith. Yes. Six I. Thank you. Number six, resolution 2019-129, authorizing an agreement with DeKalb County as it pertains to the jurisdictional transfer of portions of Rich Road and Coltonville Road from DeKalb County to the city of DeKalb as identified by the Illinois Department of Transportation, IDOT, form BLR 05212. Entertain a motion, please. So moved. Seconded. It's been moved by Alderman Favor, seconded by Alderman McAdams. City Manager Nicholas, please. Hopefully it takes me less time to explain this than it did to have to read the title. Uh, this is clearly a cleanup item, as, as mentioned in the background. Uh, when we annex, uh, we annex to the far side of the road. There was a portion of uh, Rich Road and Coltonville Road uh, in which the jurisdictional transfer was not followed up. Uh, that is, to, in this case, the county transfer to the city for our jurisdiction. And so we're asking you to uh, proceed uh, with this agreement, which will clean that up. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Verbic. Yes. Favor. Yes. Morris. Yes. Finucan. Yes. Smith. Yes. Fagan. Yes. McAdams. Yes. Mayor Smith. Yes. Eight aye. 
That motion passes that resolution. Thank you. Number seven, resolution 2019-130, authorizing a tax increment financing grant in the amount of $12,200 to the Hillside Restaurant, located at 121 North 2nd Street, for the replacement of a building sewer. I'd entertain a motion, please. So moved. Seconded. Been moved by Alderman Smith, seconded by Alderman McAdams. City Manager Nicholas, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, the uh, co-owner, Gavin Wilson, of the Hillside Restaurant is in the audience tonight and may have something to add or may not. I'll just summarize uh, the, the purpose of this grant. As I indicate in the background, uh, the Hillside Restaurant's been in a unique situation since the Egyptian project began. Uh, they have um, uh, been at ground zero, literally, uh, about a month ago, uh, their sewer lateral, which is the building sewer from the building to the main on 2nd Street, was torn up accidentally. Uh, the subcontractor that was involved is, has made amends, repaired the, the uh, sewer lateral, and uh, that might have been the end of it, except uh, the sanitary district is going to the Kishwaukee Water Reclamation District is going to be extending a main from 2nd Street to uh, the western side of the new addition for the Egyptian. And that is to be the intended new main uh, to which the Hillside Restaurant is to connect. The location of that, the elevation of that is going to uh, is going to create a further hardship uh, that was not anticipated because now this will be the option of choice. Uh, I thought under the circumstances that, and uh, in, in considering that the city is very much involved, as you know, in the Egyptian addition, that we might be able to extend some assistance to them as they do this. It's going to require work in their basement to realign the the uh, sewer pipe coming out of the wall of their of their building into this new location in the uh, Palmer Court area. So uh, that is the recommendation tonight to you. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Favor. Yes. Morris. Yes. Finucan. Yes. Smith. Yes. <coughs> Fagan. Yes. McAdams. Yes. Verbeck. Yes. Mayor Smith. Yes. Eight aye. Thank you. That resolution is approved. Thank you. Number eight, resolution 2019-131, authorizing the sale of real property located at 850 North 1st Street. That's pen 08-14-329-021 in the amount of $800. Motion, please. I have to make a motion. Second. Been moved by Alderman Fagan, seconded by Alderman Favor. City Manager Nicholas, please. Thank you, Mayor. At the last council meeting on, on August 12th, the council authorized city manager to list a number of city-owned parcels. Uh, that was resolution 2019-122. Uh, per your direction, I've since entered into a, a, a listing agreement which requires that uh, any of our properties be listed through the MLS service and also provides uh, certain expectations with respect to those listing agreements. Uh, we listed this particular property on August 15th. Uh, on August 16th, an offer in the amount of $800 was made. We didn't expect any offers. This, uh, this particular land is uh, mostly in a floodway, and the rest is in a floodplain. You think, right. well, why on earth would anybody do that? Well, the adjacent parcel owner can officially use this land as part of their side yard requirement. And so it has some value. A check for $500 in earnest money was already submitted, and uh, we don't feel that there will be other offers for this parcel, so we recommend the sale at the offered price of $800. Any further discussion? Jerry. Alderman Fagan. You know, sure, $800 doesn't seem much, but you got to remember that, you know, we brought this up a year ago during uh, budget. You know, it gets it gets a back on the tax roll. We don't have to pay anybody to mow it. Um, 
and this is what we've been looking forward to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Roll call. Morris. Yes. Finucan. Yes. <coughs> Smith. Yes. <coughs> Fagan. Yes. McAdams. Yes. Verbick. Yes. Favor. Yes. Mayor Smith. Yes. Eight I. That matter passes. Thank you. Okay, we move now to ordinances. Ordinances second reading. This is item K on your agenda. I would entertain a motion initially, a second, and we do have a number of folks who would like to speak to this item. Make a motion. Okay, there's a, there's a move by Alderman Fagan. A second. Seconded by Alderman Favor. Now, before I turn it over to uh, City Manager Nicholas for any comments he might make, uh, I'd like to see if we can have some discussion. We have quite a few folks to speak to this item. And it just grew by two. The first one, and I think these were in the order that they were presented to City Clerk Fazekas, Matthew Kapistanik. I hope by that pronounced that correctly surprisingly and, well mr. mayor okay and try to keep things again to the, everybody to uh, three minutes or less thank I'll, you. I'll give you a minute and a half thank you all right thank you mr. mayor uh, I would like to start by addressing everyone uh, here this evening um, and just say that taking a personal issue and turning it into written policy is the wrong way to govern and that appears to be what's going on with this topic. Now I'd like to specifically address the following comments to my alderman. On this very controversial issue, you spoke for a minute and 35 seconds. During that time, you listened to everybody that talked on the issue, and you said you respected what everyone had to say. Yet, without a single person in the affirmative of the of that um, law passing, uh, you voted in favor of it. You said that having an elected position, whether it's full-time or part-time, didn't work. And you felt that appointed is the way to go. So can I assume that with the way the ordinance has been rewritten, you will not be voting in favor of it this evening. I ask for you to vote for the wishes of the residents and not for the administration. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Craig Roman. And Peggy, you'll be on deck here, and we'll make sure that we get the mic to you. Okay, Craig? Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Craig Roman, District 7. Um, I have a question about the agenda, because when it was released Thursday, subsection C was uh, a lot more in-depth than the one sentence. So this goes back to Alderman uh, Morris's contention that this should be on first reading because the information you guys handed out on Thursday I don't know when this updated information was given to the residents which I don't believe met the three-day rule so if you can let me know when this was changed Not sure I understand. So you're saying that what was posted on Thursday Thursday uh -huh. does not match the agenda for this evening. It does, sir. Mr. Mayor. Alderman Favor. I I believe you're looking at the the published, but there's a link to where I think the 
full section C is listed? Because I have the duties of the executive assistant under C, Correct. and then I have both the city clerk and the deputy clerk will each have a city seal mm -hmm. as C. They do not match. The, you have to click on the blue link in the attached agenda that's on the city's website. Okay. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, either way with that, I would still have to disagree with Dr. Nicholas, that you have the right to appoint a clerk or an assistant clerk for the city clerk. The city clerk should be operating independently of itself, independently of the city manager, and independently of the city council. I do not believe that you shall have the right to appoint anyone to work in that office. If there is an issue inside the city clerk's office, we as the residents would have the right to remove the clerk and the assistant. If you appoint an assistant, we have no mechanism to remove that person. I don't get to appoint the deputy. I do get to designate, and that's because, if, if I may, Mary, and I'm sorry to... Are you finished, Mr. Bowman? Yeah. Yes. But you've asked a good question, and, and it's only fair that people mm -hmm. here. So we have a council manager form of gov government, which means the council, uh, the policy makers, and the manager, and management and the administration carry out the policies and in that process the city manager is responsible and accountable for seeing to it that the work is done so the people that the manager hires and fires are are, are a variety of people public works employees managers administrative assistants and and the like and in that context it is rational to have the manager involved in basically proposing or designating those people who otherwise have full-time jobs and as you know the deputy clerk is a person who's already doing a full-time job or a part-time job but fully involved in whatever the job is to have some time to spare in the event that the clerk needs some help that's what the deputy clerk is to do their, their title is something else but they're also designated and then eventually appointed by the clerk so it makes sense in that system the council manager form of government that the, the manager has a chance to at least say these are the people who have the time and the expertise to lend some of that to the clerk as needed that's what the system is that's not what's being changed here tonight okay. thank you okay our next speaker uh, is a special friend a special woman in this community Peggy Hoyt uh, who was a former city clerk and Peggy it's great to see you uh, always is I'm going to have Ray Munch give you a mic and you'd like to speak to this item please this is Peggy Marguerite Hoyt I spent some time writing the history of the city clerk because the city clerk when I ran for office in 1977 was a very obscure individual. I was running for an office and I didn't know what the job was going to entail. But I was a worker and I knew that when I got there I'd give it my all. And I did because the people of DeKalb elected me five times including when my own deputy ran against me. So I think I have an enviable record. And I have a place in my heart for the city clerk. Because the city clerk, when I ran for office, was authorized by the state statutes and elected by the people for the people. Not to answer to the mayor, the council, or the city manager. And I ran my office for 20 years, and I think I ma managed it with great dedication, and I was the best job I ever had. But now, after Donna and I both served our about 30 years as clerk, the stuff hit the fan and 
everything went haywire. So I'm wondering if it's possible we can turn back the clock in a manner of speaking and start again with the city clerk elected by the people for the people and the city clerk appointing her deputy who has her back and not have to answer to the mayor, the council, or the city manager. Is that possible? I don't know what that ordinance, I didn't get a copy of the ordinance. So I don't know what you're doing with the city clerk in that ordinance. So you have to tell me. And we will be discussing that, Peggy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. It's but great to see you. That's my opinion. Great to see you. <laughs> Unfortunately, you don't get the last word because there are some <laughs> other folks who would like to speak to this, Peggy. Peggy asked me before the meeting, she'd like to have last words, so, uh, but that's the order that it came up in. Thank you. Uh, the next one is Mark Scott. Is Mark here? Yes. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I hope you people are all correct, because a wise man once told me the only thing I know is what I read in the papers. <laughs> so what I'm going off of is, <clears throat> first of all, two weeks ago was the first time I have ever came here and addressed this council. Number of times I've called the mayor on the phone about issues. He told me to come to the council. Well, I was working nights. I couldn't get here. So this issue came up, very important to me. At that point in time, I tried to express the fact that there is a specific reason and purpose that the city clerk is an elected position. And it's not a, a position that should, first of all, be 10 hours a week. The, at that point in time, there was, there was a vote taken, only three of the uh, council members seemed to know and understand the purpose of that position so it didn't it didn't go through didn't go well <clears throat> but there are other things that need to need to be looked at and that is we look at the the position of the of, of the clerk and what they actually do they control a lot of things that normally can or can't be done without a seal so that cannot be handled to just everybody and anybody. Um, I'm also opposed to what I read about giving the city manager his own seal. That's taking it away. The city clerk should be the one that's elected and the only one with the seal. There are, <clears throat> we have other issues that are more important than uh, who's gonna hold the seal and stamp the papers. If for whatever reason somebody comes in here the last day and has to have it right away and she's not here, that's not her fault. He had how much time to get in here and get that thing stamped? The, you know, we're looking at people that are having all kinds of housing authorities issues. The question I have is, I, I raised my hand earlier and nobody recognized it, but don't these people have permits to operate rental property? Don't you need a permit or just put up a building and say for rent? Nobody knows the answer? I thought they did. Because of the fact that if I was any member of this city and I had a housing authority like that, the first thing I'd do is I'd pull the permit. Get them out of there and they got two choices. They could either correct the situation or the building can go down. <clears throat> but anyways, getting back to the, to the clerk's position. You're right at three minutes, Mark. Okay. Um, I'm back here to stress the fact that the clerk position should be an elected position. The council or the, uh, the people have passed the referendum two, three, four times. Last time the comment was made that 12 disciples could not speak for the multitude. Maybe what we need to do is get the multitude in here. 
You go around and get all those people with the flags on their front porch, tell them how it's being acted. Last time there was a guy mentioned a hammer and sickle on the wall. So evidently, somewhere along the line, we've lost the American way here, and we need to get it back. ASAP. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bessie Kronopoulos. Former Mayor Bessie Kronopoulos. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, I tried to do this so that, so that I could speak for somebody else too. It's on both of these items, K1 and 2. Uh, I'm trying to save you time, so I'm condensing it. Uh, Kay Shelton asked me to read her, and then I'll read mine if that's okay. Sure. This is from Kay Shelton. Uh, who used to live in the third ward, by the way, and very active in the community and so on. Smart lady. She says, the newly proposed ordinances to keep the city clerk elected yet elected rob the position completely of its power and the city seal is nothing but yet another attempt by the city administration to circumvent two referendums and grab power to do what they want, when they want, behind closed doors. The public is not fooled by what this really is about using the seal without any kind of scrutiny from the city clerk reports to the public additionally in the time that there were uh, seven clerk city clerks there were six different city managers interim city managers and the pay for those managers was rather hefty compared to the city clerks we the public know that the ridiculously low pay is to discourage anyone from running for city clerk office so the city administrators can appoint who they want before the next election, restore the elected city clerk's position to full-time with appropriate full-time pay. Kay Shelton. Thank you. She was well within her three minutes. Well, I'll try to be. I might be a couple of seconds over. I tried to time it. Okay. Peggy, it's nice to see you. And I'm going to follow your lead. I know better than not to, not to agree with Peggy. Mr. Mayor, City Council. A democracy functions best if the public is engaged in the process by staying informed, questioning, and voting. This engagement has become even more important for DeKalb citizens since there is an issue before the council that is testing the core of what democracy is all about, the city clerk matter. DeKalb operates under the council manager form of government, a mayor elected at large, seven aldermen elected to represent wards, a city clerk elected at large. The mayor and council set the policies the manager at council's direction oversees the day-to-day -day activities of the, of the city. The clerk keeps records, takes minutes, issues various licenses, and checks procedures. In 2006 and, tw and 2012, the citizens voted to maintain an elected office of the city clerk as it had been for years. Citizens clearly understood then as now the need for an independent clerk answerable directly to the people, and that is an important component of this form of government. An active, engaged, funded clerk's office had in years past a strong presence, as Peggy will attest to, in City Hall with a clerk overseeing all its functions of licensing, record keeping, minutes, FOIA, involvement in the agenda, and sitting in on staff meetings a strong presence that allowed that office to be respected as part of the day-to-day -day functions of City Hall. The last three managers have one thing in common, actively trying to undercut the city clerk's office by cutting back funding and intimidation tactics, which make it difficult for those who tried to fill that position, even those who have been duly elected with more votes each, than, each of the, than the mayors at the time, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Clerk Fazekas has been doing her job with the, with the hope of someday bringing the city clerk's office back to where it once was. She has been courageous in protecting that office. She initiated the idea of setting up a committee to look, up, to look into ethics policies of the city. She prepared and put forth a progress report of the clerk's office in hopes of having a public discussion council to improve the office. This desire to discuss the goal of resolving was not met with open arms. If anything, there were threats of public embarrassment. Next, 
was the attempt to withhold the report from the council rather than to use it as the catalyst for public discussion of the clerk's office. Then there was the questionable co-op session meeting after which the mayor asked the clerk to resign, another questionable action. The next move was to present questionable ordinances which in effect were written to make the clerk's position appointed in direct opposition to the wishes of the public and form of government. And tonight, as Alderman Morris pointed out, and tonight we again are faced with ordinances up for second reading which have suggested amending and additions apparently from the city manager. Not exactly proper procedure. Thankfully, three members of council had the courage not to fall prey to the limited and skewed information and advice, legal advice, that they were receiving about this matter. One instinctively knew that there was something wrong with the manner in which the closed session was conducted. Thank you, Carolyn. The council manager form of government is a good form if it's properly followed. It's time that the council understands clearly that they are in charge, and it's time for us, the public, to understand that it is our duty to speak out in questions so that our representatives have ample information about all topics and not just the skewed version backed by poor legal advice they seem to have been giving lately. I respectfully thank you for listening. Bessie Kronopoulos. Thank you, Bessie. Steve Capitan. Thank you. <clears throat> Pardon me, I have a still recovering from a bit of a cold. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, I question that even this amended ordinance is needed to resolve the dispute over the seal. That's an administrative process that could have been and should have been done and pursued uh, beyond just an attempt at asking for a meeting and then when the first request was made it was refused that you move to change the structure of the ordinance. That is inappropriate and unprofessional. The turnover of the city clerk's office over the last seven years is due to the council making it a poorly paid part-time position. Those conflicts stem from that, and that is what needs to be addressed. That is something that Clerk Fizik has raised in her progress report. But we are witnessing tonight the value of having a process of passing ordinances on first reading at one meeting, and then finally passing it at second reading at the next meeting. This gives the council and the public two weeks to consider the question before final passage. <coughs> it's true of all ordinances. This is especially true of an ordinance that attempts to change the structure of our city government, not to mention going against the will of the people as demonstrated in two referenda. The mayor and the council members and the four council members who voted for the short circuiting for short circuiting this process should thank the three council members who respected the process and the public. If you had gotten your way in rushing this ordinance through two weeks ago, you would be facing the embarrassment of reversing yourself tonight rather than passing amendments to an ordinance. I have uh, a couple of questions and then a final sentence. First of all, what process was used to change the ordinance prior to the posting for this meeting? What was that process? Was there a meeting? Um, who was involved? That's the second question. Finally, <coughs> the city attorney assures us that changes to an ordinance upon second reading are legal. But just because something is legal doesn't mean that it is right. Thank you, Steve. John Anderson. I 
thought for a minute there was two John Andersons in the room, but I guess I'm wrong. Uh, I don't know what these changes are that you made in this 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 uh, amendment, but uh, to me, if you made a change, this would be the first reading, not the second. And one thing I can't understand, you know, all all seven of you aldermen and the mayor were voted on by the people. You represent the people. You don't represent the city staff. And you could have gone to, to Sycamore and found out just how many thousand people voted to keep the clerk's office elected. And, and you're just voting just the opposite way of what the people have already told you. I don't know. This young lady in the first ward here said the only sensible statement last week. And I do apologize for, for the swastika symbol and all. It isn't that bad. But it sounded like we were right back in World War II. And I, I'm, I'm apologizing for that statement. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, John. Dwayne Brown. Dwayne Brown, how many referendums do we need for the public to say they want an elected city clerk? Uh, maybe a couple more, I don't know. Uh, we, we never had problems before when we had a full-time elected clerk. This all started in the past few years that we've had this uh, part-time city clerk and it, it hasn't worked out. We used to have meetings here to go back to the, the full-time city clerk. I remember that and uh, actually nothing was done. You know, we got sidetracked on this part-time city clerk. Uh, what we need is, is a full-time elected clerk with a salary, I said before, at $68,000, uh, eliminate the two deputies, eliminate the uh, part-time clerk, have one strong full-time clerk. It would still save us money. Uh, that the, uh, I, I believe ordinance 2019-054, I agree with the people, that should be a first reading. That was changed, that was, that should be first reading, even though the, the council voted it down. Uh, I think you should listen to Rick Amato. You know, I, I don't know. I went through all the, uh, you know, the ILS state laws on this, and I couldn't determine if it was legal or not under the uh, uh, form of government we have, you know. But uh, I know one thing. I know the, the people want an elected clerk. We deserve that. And... Uh, as Peggy White mentioned, our Constitution says, by the people, for the people. You know, when you change that, you're going to either a socialist government, a communist government, or a dictatorship. And we're not that. We're a democracy. You can't change that. We need an elected clerk, and we need to go back to a full-time one. Thank you. Thank you, Duane. Two weeks ago, at the conclusion of our city council meeting, I stated that we as a city council are entrusted to do the right thing. At the time, I joined four aldermen who thought that the issues that we faced, and those issues were part and parcel of the fact that we've had so many appointed and elected city clerks over the last seven, eight, nine years. But those four aldermen, and I joined them, we thought the issues that we faced would be best served by approving an ordinance which would allow the appointment of a city clerk. And while this city could certainly join a host of other Illinois municipalities in making this change, it was clear that we had not adequately listened to the citizenry that who had voted by referendum that DeKalb's city clerk 
should be an elected position. And after meeting with DeKalb County State's Attorney Rick Amato, it was very clear that passing the ordinance would put us on thin ice. Our city manager, Bill Nicholas, was of like thinking and publicly reversed his stance and agreed that we should continue with the position being elected. In doing so, he has recommended that we defeat, on second reading, the ordinance that called for an appointed city clerk. And that will come before us tonight. During the last couple of weeks, both City Clerk Lynn Fizikas and Executive Assistant Ruth Scott, who had been carrying on the duties of Clerk Fizikas's a deputy, they felt harmed. They're hurt. They felt harmed by the onslaught of remarks, commentary, published comments. Neither deserved that treatment. It has not been an easy task to bring the kind of unity between our city manager's office and the office of city clerk, a task that I've continued to undertake since early June. We're still not there yet. With differing views on how we can serve the public with the administrative duties that need to be accomplished. I hope that over the coming weeks we can indeed have an honest, thoughtful discussion among all parties to stamp a resolution to our differences. To do otherwise would be shirking the duties that we have pledged to carry out. We must do the right thing. With that, we have a motion on the floor, a second to that motion. I'd like to ask City Manager Nicholas to speak to this item, please. Thank you, Mayor. Let me just explain uh, what we understood would be evident to the general public and also to the people in the room tonight. So after meeting with State's Attorney Rick Amato on Wednesday, the Mayor and I had some conversation and the, the uh, agenda comes out by law no later than I think it's 7 p.m. on on Thursday so we had uh, about a day to think how we would like to frame this up so the public could see what uh, might be suggested in the way of a revision and so if you went to the website and you were looking for what was coming up you would see a red line version so what we tried to do is make as evident as you can without uh, basically having a, an audio which it wasn't possible and that was to show how the ordinance that had been up for council review on first reading at the last meeting on the, uh, the 12th uh, what what was staying and what by uh, suggestion only might be revised and going from top to bottom it's, it's pretty evident that the, where, the whereases that were direct, directly uh, touching on the, the work either of the city clerk or the deputy clerk were excised. The principal points that remain are these, that the clerk remains in elected office. Uh, the deputy clerk performs those duties that are listed in the, many of which have not changed in the uh, revision as before you and uh, they reflect the practice of the deputy city clerk for many years. Both the city clerk and the deputy clerk would each have a city seal. And for those that maybe don't know, I mean there's uh, some of the stories out there have, have served to defend a point but not necessarily the facts. So the facts are According to our code, as it's written now and as it's been for many years, even in Peggy Hoyt's time, uh, the deputy clerk was able to transact the business of the office of the clerk in his or her absence, which included affixing the seal to public documents. That's not changed. That's not proposed to be changed here tonight, and it wasn't proposed to be changed before, 
but it was it was proposed that we would affirm that because it is stated in, in several parts of section 3.14 of the city code which is the city clerk passages uh, because that wasn't being done we thought we should underline it and put a question or a exclamation point after it else people coming in and, and very seldom it's the people that are late to the mark oftentimes it's people who have been waiting for a license to process through the city system and get to the council and to be approved they're anxious to get their business going or to keep their business going and so they come and they ask for the sealed signed license and if you can't get that and you're in that position you will be very frustrated and if you come back the next day and you still can't get it you'll be even more frustrated so the idea was have a couple seals there are three actually that we um, currently have under the city not the city clerk but under the city's uh, guidance and so we were looking to see that those could be shared so that work could be done uh, as I said earlier the city manager currently designates the city employees who have the time and the expertise to perform functions as deputy clerk that is in what's before you tonight in the amended version um, the deputy clerk as is currently the case will not receive any extra compensation or special benefits for serving in the clerk's office so they are doing a job now they are going to make they're going to stretch and make time to help with the clerk in the absence of the clerk or at the clerk's request that's what that's about and any employee who serves as deputy clerk would remain a, a um, what we call a chapter 3 city employee which is to say that they they've been hired they've been hired to a position that's been advertised they're filling a position they have the credentials to fill that position and um, by our code the only credentials you need to be the city clerk are that you're 21 years of age or older uh, resident of, of this community and shall not have been convicted of a felony finally the everyday duties of the clerk and the deputy clerk are enumerated in what's proposed to you tonight and in our conversation with the uh, state's attorney he said it was not the interest of his office how the council which is sovereign in these matters defines those duties it was his interest, his very strong interest, um, that this position remain a elected position. And the mayor was there with me when we were having this conversation. And um, I listened, I heard that, and I've also heard what people said here, and that's why what's proposed tonight is before you. And we recommend your approval of this particular uh, ordinance and uh, when we get to the next ordinance as the mayor said uh, I'm asking that you disapprove that ordinance which was to change from an appointed or from elected to appointed okay we've had uh, quite a few folks speak to this item we appreciate that we really do appreciate the input I appreciate uh, your comments uh, city manager Nicholas and I hope that my statement had some clarity as it relates to uh, what I felt uh, we have done not only the past two weeks but the past several months and for the media I do have a copy of that statement if you'd like it following the meeting okay with that uh, Mr. Mayor, yes I may offer as an amendment to the uh, first red ordinance sure the uh, proposal by uh, Mr. Nicholas with just a, uh, a minor change in uh, under the deputy city clerk there's a section where it says from city personnel and staff who are authorized by the city manager uh, we want to change that wording to designated not authorized that's uh, to be consistent with something is in there earlier uh, otherwise as the amended uh, um, proposed amendment is presented uh, I'd like to offer that for approval as the amendment would you tell me where that is yes sir it's on the um, fourth page of the document you're looking at under uh, deputy city clerks about the fifth line down 
So from the city personnel and staff who are authorized should instead say designated. Who are, does everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Who are designated by the city manager, not authorized. Okay. Do I have a second to that motion? Second. It's been moved by Alderman Finucane, seconded by Alderman McAdams, that we change one word in well, actually, in the, in the, I'm offering as an amendment the whole proposal, but with that one change in the printed material. Right, right. Okay. That's what we're, that's what we're voting on now, just changing that one word. No, sir. We are the, I'm changing that as part of my original amendment to, okay. to replace the previously, uh, the previous document. Which the red line. All right, so Jerry, well, all we're talking about is I make an amendment to the original proposal. As printed, I want to change one word in the offered amendment, and that is just designated. So that's all part of my original okay. amendment that we use that as part of that proposal, we ch change that word to designated. Okay. So the whole proposal is the amendment with one word change. So. Okay, thank you. So we should first vote on the amendment, and then we will vote. Well, we should have some discussion on the amendment before right. we would okay. vote on it. Yeah. Precisely. I've asked for that. Right. Okay. Is there any further discussion on that amendment that Alderman yes. Fanucas? So uh, I'm going to ask uh, City Manager Nicholas to offer some clarification on uh, paragraph F, which is also on that page immediately above that, about uh, the office hours of the city clerk. Right. It, it says that the city clerk shall keep the office. It's not specific to the hours. And I mean, it's. Yep. Yeah, I think, Bill, with you and I discussed the other day that we wanted to make sure that it's understood that the city clerk is not expected to be in the building all the hours that the building is open, but between the city clerk and the deputy, any of the business of the city clerk's office could be transacted. That's correct. It, it assumes that there will be a partnership here between the city clerk and a deputy clerk so the two together can keep that office open. It does. Could our legal counsel speak to whether it could be interpreted otherwise? Could that possibly be interpreted to mean that the city clerk who is in that elected role ought to be here all the time? I, I yield to the council. Uh, we can make it more specific. Uh, this is um, uh, this is language that was not changed. As you can see, it was not underlined, so it was not changed. Right. I I think along with this amendment, it's just good to keep in mind that when when Bill spoke to it, he noted that quote we had about a day to throw this together, and I think we had you know at least one person mentioned in their comments that they were curious about what the process was to get to this, um, to this ordinance. And Bill spoke to that. And I think that... Bill. Bill Nicholas, I apologize. Okay. Bill Nicholas spoke to that. And I think that information would underscore the importance of looking at this more closely, more deliberately, and intentionally writing this ordinance with best practices of government in mind rather than something that that is admittedly rushed. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. She's got, she gets it. Mayor, may I? Yes. I and we talked about this last Thursday and at that time you agreed that this was a good compromise. Um, this was not rushed by any means. We've been discussing this now for a long time, and we were drawing from words we've heard here and advice and guidance we've received from other legal authority, as I've discussed here tonight. So what I was trying to do was to, was to reflect those comments and suggestions. That's what's here before you tonight. So 
If I thought it was not soup, I wouldn't have brought it forward. I understand what you're saying, and I respect the work that you have done to put forward something that um, is respectable, but I think that there are just a number of problems with this. If we were listening to what we're hearing, it's abundantly evident that what we're hearing over and over again is the same thing, and it is not let's better define the duties of this role. What we're hearing from the people is this needs to be a full-time position. And I don't want to, we have people coming out that we've never seen before. Okay, I understand that we frequently hear from the same people and so perhaps you discount their input because you've heard it over and over again. I want us to note that we have every random person in the community out here speaking to this, underscoring the fact that this has been voted upon already, and yet, and so when the city manager and I spoke this past Thursday, I respected that we were adjusting this to the concept of redefining the duties as an appointed clerk, or I'm sorry, as an elected clerk, redefining those duties. That was a good compromise to move toward a new idea here. But there are just too many problems with us. Alderman Verbeck. Has the state's attorney reviewed this and approved it? Well, it would never be for the state's attorney to approve your ordinances. But uh, the state's attorney can, can weigh in and has and it wasn't his interest to to uh, say I agree with these words every word and so forth um, he agreed that with my suggestion it would be a good idea to uh, remove a lot of the whereases he also agreed that the and if he was here tonight he would say this I believe uh, that the uh, the duties and the assignment of duties one to the other deputy to, to to city clerk and back, that's your prerogative. His principal interest, and he's made this very clear in a, in a letter that was made very public a couple weeks ago, had to do with uh, how the clerk is selected, and that's not changed in what's before you here tonight. I also might add that uh, the, the city, according to state law, the, the city clerk's salary can't be adjusted during the current term. So we can make, for instance, the city clerk uh, a full-time job, which it is, in, in effect, or not, but the, the, the remuneration won't change, and as a number of people said here tonight, I don't know if that will solve the problem. Uh, so what's, what you're addressing here tonight is, is the part-time city clerk and the possibility of, of duties assigned to a deputy clerk to be designated by the manager and appointed by the clerk. So the state's attorney has not objected to this? It's not objected, no. Okay. Uh, I would like to ask the uh, city clerk. Uh, the city clerk, have you objected to this latest proposal? Do you have any objections to this latest proposal? Thank you for asking. I have major objections with this proposal. Are you able to please help us with the, the details of those objections? I think I have them pretty well memorized. Please. Well, with an elected clerk, there are some statutory powers that go with an elected clerk. Those statutory powers might go away if you have a referendum that changes to an appointed clerk. However, that has not happened. Um, it is therefore, in just wholly in my opinion, incumbent upon the council to get the local ordinances in line with those statutory powers. And those include how the city seal is designated. It includes how the deputy clerks are appointed and it includes how those deputy clerks are supervised. Also, there's a lot of housekeeping that needs to be done with that ordinance in general. 
For example, the very first, the very first um, provision is that the clerk um, puts up a $1,000 bond. That bond is actually $5,000. I just paid it. So th there, there are some major things to be changed, and this is something that um, the, the community has spoken about ever since the position was gutted by another council in 2012. And we've lived with it, and it hasn't worked well. As everybody's talked about, the over, uh, basically the uh, overturning of uh, the language that should apply to an elected clerk actually applies. Section 3.14 actually applies very well to an appointed clerk, but not to an elected clerk. So if you're ready to go back to the drawing board, I am too. So, Alderman Verbeek. So yeah. perhaps then a workshop to sort through these things versus what I have a feeling here uh, amounts to peeing in the wind uh, that we should we should sit down together and sort out what are those best practices uh, up to and including what is the FTE of the city clerk's office is it is the work that's required is equivalent to uh, one full-time person 1.5 two I think we need to determine that because a lot of what I heard and why I supported a point was this notion of accountability. So I've heard people time and time again say, well, we can elect a city clerk and then they don't even have to show up. So I guess it, maybe it goes to the language that we have to clean up to make sure we have the requirements in place, the competencies that we expect, the process that we expect and can afford. and. I, I think that this doesn't get us anywhere, but if we're all willing to work together in a workshop with the clerk, with the city manager, with legal, I think we can get there. I, I would say that there is a lot of room for negotiation and compromise, but only on the non-statutory duties. With the non-statutory duties can be done by um, any uh, qualified administrative assistant. Uh, they don't have to be specially deputized either. But it's the statutory duties that are important to restore. And this now, I hope, is our opportunity to do that. I think you echo my last paragraph in my statement. I hope that over the coming weeks we can indeed have an honest, thoughtful discussion among all parties to stamp a resolution to our differences. To do otherwise would be shirking our duties. So Carolyn, I'm going to get back to you. And I don't know if that's proper for the mayor to ask an alderman in public, but I will. What do you want to do? Do you want to table this? I think it would be You want to table it and then excellent to table And then I'm I'm going to let you who Bessie says gets it, you get it. I want you to be at the forefront of helping us to do what it is that you feel we need to do. Now, does that make sense? It or does. am I taking words out of your mouth? No, thank you. I appreciate that, that opportunity. And I will be happy to try to lead us in the right direction. Any further discussion? There has been. Peggy, I can't let you speak right now, but let us have the, our discussion, okay? Um, and uh, believe me, I'd love to hear you, but I just, I feel that at this point, we want this discussion. It was a point of order. Oh, okay, yes. If you table discussion and don't make a specific date for that discussion, the subject is dead. Alderman Morris gets it. <laughs> so she would probably put a date on that, wouldn't you, Carolyn? I'll put a date on it. Next meeting, how's that? Okay. Or let's, sh do we want to discuss when the best time for that is? Obviously, it's probably best to discuss how long it would take us to assess this. Does anyone have any? Scott's leaving. 
Alderman McAdams. We do have a motion on the floor that we need to vote on, but I think a good suggestion would be that we discuss it at the next city uh, cow meeting uh, before the meeting on the, I believe that's the 9th of September. Okay. That would be agreeable to you. Okay. Any other comments? We have a motion on the floor. Yes. There is the motion on the floor of the amendment. That needs to be addressed first. Would you repeat your the motion to amend, please, so that we know what we're voting on? All right. So, May, one point of, of order: uh, there was a motion, I believe, made to table. I did not hear a a second. Under Robert's rules, a motion to table would essentially take precedence over over everything okay. else. Right, thank if there's a provided, there's a second to that. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded that we table this ordinance for further consideration on the 9th, 10th, whatever that date is, of September. Do we need to vote on that? Roll call. Finucan. Yes. Smith. Yes. Fagan. Yes. McAdams. Yes. Verbeck. Yes. Favor? Yes. Morris? Yes. Mayor Smith? Yes. Eight aye. So that ordinance uh, on second reading is tabled for further discussion on the next meeting in September. Thank you. <laughs> okay, now we go to number two, ordinance 2019-055. Providing that the city clerk shall be appointed officer of the city of DeKalb. City manager is recommending that this item be defeated on second reading. I'd entertain a motion. So moved. Seconded. It's been moved and seconded by Alderman Morris, seconded by Alderman McAdams. Should be defeated. That we defeat this ordinance in second reading. So if a vote yes means that we are defeating this motion. No, clarification no. please. I, I believe, believe it's a yes. vote no Correct. will right. defeat it. Right. Right. Yes. Because we've just, so the motion's made to approve the, approve the, the uh, ordinance and we need to vote no right. for it to be defeated. Okay, okay. So a yes, a yes vote would be that we approve the ordinance uh, providing the city clerk shall be appointed other than elected. The no vote would mean that we favor uh, the elected over the appointed. Correct. correct. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you. I appreciate all the help, believe me. Okay, any further discussion? Roll call, please. Smith. No. Fagan. No. <laughs> McAdams. No. Verbeck. No. Favor. No. Morris. No. Finucan. No. Seven nay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we will uh, take up that first ordinance uh, on September, the first meeting in September. Okay, now we get to ordinances first reading. Item L on the agenda. Number one, ordinance 2019-057 authorizing a zoning map amendment from the L1 light industrial district to the PDC plan development commercial district and approving a plan development preliminary and final plan agreement, 204 North 4th Street and 420 Oak Street, Agora Tower, Mooney property, by PNG Development, LLC. I'd entertain a motion, please. So moved. Second. Been moved by Alderman Finucane, seconded by Alderman Smith. And I believe we have one person who would like to speak to this. No, two people would like to speak to this. The first one is Steve Capitan. 
and then Jeff Lewis on deck. Thank you, Mayor. I'll be brief. Um, I just wanted to reiterate my opposition to including the purchase price of the property in calculating the percentage of city subsidy. As a matter of policy, I, I would continue to advocate that that's appropriate for um, city subsidy considerations, including this proposal. Um, I, but substantively on this ordinance, uh, I wanted to uh, express my concern about the parking on Locust. Um, I just wanted to uh, establish conf confirmation, get confirmation that this will be public parking, and then also suggest that consideration should be given for um, short-term parking for access to the businesses on the first level. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Lewis. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and I will likewise be brief. You've got extensive uh, documentation in your packet. Um, I read before coming tonight that Naperville just set a record for the longest city council meeting ever getting done somewhere around 2.30 in the morning, and um, we're nowhere near that. I don't think we're going to go there either. I'm really so. happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, the plan is going to be very much like what you've already seen. Um, John Pappas, uh, the, the primary developer, is here. Uh, Dr. Glasgow, one of his key partners, is here. They've done a, a great job with the Cornerstone project, uh, a great job with the Plaza de Cal project. Um, it's similar in, in terms of having uh, higher-end apartments, executive suites, uh, top-end uh, commercial and office-type space on the ground level. Um, and, and I won't bore you with all of the same details you can read as well as I can. Uh, we wanted to make ourselves very available to the council to answer any additional questions that may come up uh, and, and address any concerns that, that there may be. Uh, but with that, I'll, I'll thank you for the time. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, City Manager Nicholas. Thank you, Mayor. As uh, Mr. Lewis said, this is a project that has uh, been under consideration now for a number of months. It's been through two plan commission reviews. Uh, I'm just going to very briefly summarize the essentials that are before you tonight. Uh, I, I know you've had a chance to look at the documents in the background. Uh, any specific questions you may have, I'll, I'll try to answer, and if not, I'll defer to Dan Olson, who's been involved in particularly the, the planning and zoning part of it. So the the council at this point, when, when you're getting a, a, a large development, you're looking at two things. Uh, and one is, of course, the zoning petition and the, and the plan applications. And the other is a development agreement. And the development agreement builds on earlier conversation that the council had when you approved the preliminary development agreement. So there's a final development agreement here. And uh, I think it was mentioned earlier, we're talking about a, a, a very large project, 113,000 square feet. It's mixed use with commercial on the first level, four stories all together. Um, the subject site is about three acres. You know where it's located. I won't um, draw your attention to that. It's, it's uh, the former Mooney uh, dealership, though, and that had been, has been vacant since 2012. So back in June, on June 10th, the council approved uh, a resolution committing to a preliminary TIF agreement. That resolution had two parts. It dedicated 2075000 from TIF-1 funds for a variety of purposes, including uh, structural and architectural design, engineering and surveying, uh, uh, environmental remediation, demolition, footing removal, and land acquisition and some other items as well. Uh, that resolution that, that you approved back in June also identified a commitment of an additional $462,500 when this L-shaped facility was 50% completed and then a final $462,500 when final occupancy was granted uh, from the city. Uh, and that's an additional 925000 on top of the $2,075,000 for a total of $3 million uh, in uh, assistance. 
and that comes to about 21.6 percent of the project cost if anybody's keeping track uh, a key consideration in your support then, and I assume in your consideration tonight, is a projected return on your investment. And that's always been uh, of interest, and, and most especially in recent years, where our TIF fund and TIF assistance is concerned. So what, how do we calculate that? Well, in 2018, the EAV, the Equalized Assessed Valuation, of the land and the buildings on that vacant property was just under 300,000 and based on that EAV a total of $35,563 in property taxes were generated for all the taxing bodies not the city but all, all local taxing bodies all of the proposed $13,875,000 in project costs will not fall under the tax under the tax rolls there are soft costs involved in the development of this size that that aren't going to be uh, included in that assessed valuation by the township assessor. Uh, same with some other environmental remediation, public infrastructure, so forth. But conservatively figuring that the what would fall is about ten million one hundred forty thousand dollars, and that one third of the market value for that is three million three hundred eighty thousand dollars. Projected EAV will conservatively generate a total property tax of about 400,000 upon full assessment. So 400,000 versus $35,563. Big change once the building is fully assessed and, and online. And then that lasts into anybody's foreseeable future. That will easily uh, offset the proposed, we, we are calling it a forgivable loan, that's our, our language. We, there's a mortgage involved, and which is sort of our protection that if for some reason the project isn't done or doesn't, doesn't pay back in that period of 20 years uh, what we expect, then, then the balance is due, basically. The, uh, the pl concept plan was was uh, really vigorously gone over by the Planning Commission back in May. Based on that feedback, a whole new project elevation and floor plan uh, resulted. Uh, and we're very pleased with the flexibility of the development firm. Uh, the proposed building will have 47 one-bedroom units and 47 two-bedroom units, uh, and with approximately 12,000 square feet on the ground level for commercial space. A lot of other things that, that you know from your background, uh, high-end finishes, as Mr. Lewis said, and fitness center, business center, meeting room, theater room, hospitality room, so on and so forth. Uh, the comprehensive plan uh, has identified this uh, for other purposes, light industrial. There are some changes that are part of what's before you tonight. As you read through this, you can see that uh, we're looking to uh, make this a planned development. Uh, the parking is addressed in that uh, it meets the what we consider our requirements for parking. Uh, after looking carefully at, at actual and projected parking needs of, of the building uh, as a whole. Environmental reports, we know that there are issues here that have to be addressed, and those were uh, presented to the Plan Commission. The recommendation that came from the Plan Commission to you back on August 7th was to um, approve, and that vote was four to zero. Uh, at the staff level, we recommend your approval of the Plan Commission recommendation. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded on this uh, first reading of this ordinance. Any further discussion? Alderman Verbeek. We've had uh, properties develop over the years. You know, some are just 20 years old and 30 years old, and I think we heard clearly from a number of folks in here earlier this evening uh, a lot of the challenges that they are having. Uh, with the public investment going into this property, what are some protections? What is some language that could be included for the life of this project so that we don't end up in the situation we're in tonight? An ongoing situation with particular property owners that choose not to do 
the right thing. They don't step up. So Mr. Pappas and his partners likely won't own this forever. So what what is specific language language we can put in here because I'm very hesitant to support this kind of project where it, we're having property owners really just take advantage of not only the city but residents left and right. Not saying that you would ever do that, but what does the future lie for this property in the city of DeKalb? The one thing, and we heard a lot of uh, very concerned and passionate uh, testimony earlier. The one thing that you can't preclude, you can't, you can't enact a law against is the kind of, of uh, insidious indifference that a particular proper, uh, rental property group has brought into our community. Uh, and the mayor said it well that uh, really but for that group and its business model which is basically to extract and not and to put in the most minimal uh, property maintenance uh, measures and so forth and basically to make us sue make us take them to court and then find some way to enforce the judgments after the court has ruled because the court then doesn't enforce its own judgments we have to find a way to do that sometimes that means another court level or another court battle uh, and it means doing the things that we can do under law so in, in a society of laws that's the best we can do it the law doesn't anticipate uh, the kind of um, uh, the kind of heavy th handed thing that may enter our minds but cannot be done so uh, in this case as in the case of we heard earlier this evening, Hunter, uh, you, can't, you can't legislate your way to a easy solution. You can't enforce your way to an easy solution. Uh, and uh, I, I can't change that. Mr. Pappas can't change that. What we do know is for this agreement, what the, this particular ownership group brings to the table they have a track record that doesn't, it's 180 degrees removed from uh, what we heard earlier. And uh, the agreement goes for 20 years here. They will pay off that, that loan, that forgivable loan, well in advance of the 20 years. They have shown that that is the case in the past. And so we can't say we're not going to develop because we're afraid that we're going to have people without scruples and without any kind of business that ethic operate in our community. We just can't legislate against that. I know of no way. I don't know if the city attorney knows of a way. We've gone over this. We have good faith in what's before you tonight. We are just so very grateful that after seven years, uh, and, and even as last year's the Mooney property was under uh, capitalized and underproducing. Uh, uh, we're so happy that a person, a, a group, has a number of people have been willing to step up and take the risk and invest as much as they are proposing to do. I think they might say, what are we going to do to make sure that their investment is protected? But I don't think we have to worry about what they're going to do to protect our interest. I couldn't agree with you more there, uh, City Manager Nicholas. And Mike, I would just use a very simple analogy. If I build a house today, what guarantee can I give you that someone may buy that house and have a house of ill repute or a house of something that is not very sundry, you know, in this environment? And, you know, I mean, here are folks who have a track record. When we look at this proposal, it was thoroughly vetted by our Planning and Zoning Commission. I think they voted unanimously for its approval. So uh, I've gotten to know you quite well over the last few years. And I know your concern. I share many of the same concerns you have. I, I don't know if I can look at a ordinance that we have before us 
and agree with your stance tonight. So respectfully, I respectfully disagree. So, and, and I understand, Mayor, but we're not giving you millions of dollars to build your house. So there, there's a there's a Have difference. Have you seen there. my house plan? No, no, no. No, <laughs> so, uh, no, no it, I, I understand. It's apples I understand. Oranges, but I understand. appreciate your opinion. I understand. I'll in favor. So I, um, if I did my calculation correctly on my my calculator here, the uh, return on investment actually comes at uh, actually 6.7 years if we use, if your EAV assessment is conservative, as I hope it was. So this project will pay it, pay back those lending the money, it'll pay back $3 million in 6.7 years. In 10 years, uh, at a 3.5% interest rate, which is inflation rate, um, we're at over four and a half, four point seven million dollars. So we're not even to the twenty year uh, that we've that we've given in the agreement. But this is the kind of project that I love to see. We're moving in the direction that the the council, when I came on, um, their vision was to lend money, in decreasing the uh, the value that the city would give, in hopes that other projects would come into DeKalb and would want to, you know, those that took the risk uh, the first time through would get the most money, higher percentage. Um, but I think this is a great project. Um, again, it's going to be a great addition to DeKalb and I'm glad to have it in our community. Thank you. Alderman Smith. Uh, I'm going to agree with both aldermen. Um, Alderman Burbick, I agree with you, but I think we have a group of people that were here tonight that are probably going to change the way we do business in the city that I, I think will see projects like this keep going. Um, you know, I sat through the plan commission. They were nothing but praise about the project um, for what Mr. Pappas had presented. So I have to vote in favor of this one. And I, I really do think, I have faith in our citizens now if, that everything has taken place in the city that uh, we're going to see some changes. Alderman Morris. And I, I think along those lines, you know, we took some steps at the last meeting to work toward moving in the right direction with that. And I think, you know, we'll try to invest some more time in that and see if we can't come up with something a little more solid that'll cover it all. Yeah, we've, I mean, we've seen what Cornerstone, we've seen what Plaza de Calb, we've seen that they acted almost as a catalyst for, fut for further improvement in our downtown with other merchants uh, and uh, so this here could be uh, a huge game changer I would think okay any further comments when we're yes Alderman uh, Smith I had a discussion with mr. Pappas about potentially some of the bigger timbers I know people have asked you know what do you do with the old lumber I wish my grandfather was alive so it, Mr. Pappas and I thought we may be able to set some of that aside for some people that like to recycle that large, those large timbers that exist, that I know exist in that building. I know who else has been in that building. But I don't know if that would curtail any of this project or if that's something Dan may have to speak to if we can add in. Uh, but John and I had, did have a brief conversation about that. Um, basically recycled some of it to uh, people that may want, but I don't want to impede the project because I know removing the uh, environmentals is going to be a, quite a big task in that building. That's really all I have to say. Thank you. Any further discussion? Roll call. Smith. Yes. Fagan. McAdams. Yes. Verbeck. No. Favor. Yes. Morris. Yes. Finucan. Yes. Smith. Yes. Six I, one nay, one absent. Right. And Alderman Fagan uh, abstained himself or recused himself from that vote because of his uh, relationship, business relationship uh, with the developer. I'd like to make a motion that we waive second reading and approve. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we uh, waive second reading and approve this. City Manager Nicholas. 
Uh, I'd like to bring this back for second reading. Usually you hear me say something differently. But uh, uh, Mr. Pappas was away uh, out of the country visiting family and uh, some things that we'd like to do to just polish and, and tweak right, that I'll withdraw agreement. my motion then. Yeah, uh, we'd, we'd like to bring it back to you, making sure that we're all on the same page. Okay. Thank you. That motion has been withdrawn and that second has been withdrawn. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that motion passes on second reading. It'll come back for second reading uh, at our next meeting. That concludes most of the items on the agenda. I would like to now give our aldermen the opportunity to make any reports they would like. And I'll start with Alderman Morris. Um, I just want to thank all the people that came out tonight, especially to speak to the Hunter Prop, the, uh, the issues going on <laughs> with um, different landlords in our community. Um, I would love to say that those were unique experiences, but those experiences I have heard over and over again from a wide number of people. Um, the one woman talking about getting a new uh, apartment that had the door kicked in and garbage inside it I have heard that from multiple tenants that was not a unique story however horrific it was it was not unique um, so I just want to thank them all for coming out that's really important and hopefully we can as uh, you know David Rathke mentioned come together and make some significant forward progress on this amen um, Oh, yeah. Alderman Fanukin. Yeah, I'd just like to comment. I'm I'm very uh, glad that we are moving towards reaching a compromise on the city clerk and the uh, how things are happening there. And I'm glad that we've agreed to remain in elected position. Also, I want to comment. This was a past week and was a great weekend for DeKalb. A very successful corn fest and the uh, students returning to NIU along with the DeKalb schools opening up and both uh, this Friday night is the Barb's football opener and Saturday of course are the Huskies versus the uh, Redbirds of Illinois State. Great. Alderman Smith. I uh, really won't see any more other than great time at Corn Fest. Um, that's really about it. Alderman Fagan. No report. Alderman McAdams. No report. Alderman Verbeek. No report. And Alderman Favor. I will echo uh, Second Ward Alderman's comments about Corn Fest. I think this was probably the best year. I mean, the weather was just mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the uh, change up, putting the vendors down the center, I think that was fantastic. I don't know why that was never done years ago, but that was the best. You were able to, s to visit all the shops in DeKalb you know, walk along the shops there as well as visit the tents and uh, this, those vendors set up in the middle. Oh, that was a fantastic format. Thank you. You know, I wish we could bottle what we heard tonight because this is democracy in action. And if this were a civics class or I was speaking to a civics class, I'd say attend this meeting, but not just one meeting, attend a number of meetings, attend your board and commission meetings. Uh, read the media accounts of what is happening in your community and try to believe that the people you elect, these people up here, truly care about what is happening in the city of DeKalb. We really do. And part and parcel of that is listening. We have listened, we have heard the public, we have made some honest discussion and action tonight. And I truly appreciate that. I really do. City Clerk Fazekas, any report? I, I would just like to um, thank the public who had uh, come out tonight to speak on the city clerk issue as well as two weeks ago, as well as when um, this, uh, when these conflicts first uh, came out. Um, I'm trying to do my best by the elected clerk position because it is the elected clerk until it's not. And I could not have done this without the um, support, the questions, um, and uh, the, the interest by the media, everything. Thank you. 
City Manager Nicholas. No report. We do have an executive session tonight. Uh, I'd like to read this in, in its entirety and then I would uh, ask for a motion. Uh, I'd like a motion to approve uh, an executive session, a recess into executive session for approval to hold an executive session to discuss pending or imminent litigation as provided for in 5 ILCS 120-2C11. I'd make a motion, I'd entertain a motion, please. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Verbeek, seconded by Alderman Fagan, that we recess into executive session. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Fagan. Yes. McAdams. Yes. Verbeek. Yes. Favor. Yes. Morris. Yes. Finucane. Yes. Smith. Yes. And Mayor Smith. Yes. Eight I. Thank you. We are now in recess. Thank you very much. <laughs>